Welcome to the Maddie Rocks Experience and On the Road with Maddie Rocks on location at the new Gander Mountain Store in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. Joined with special guest, country star, Mr. Daryl Worley. How you doing, Maddie? Good. It's good to be joining. here. Thanks thank, for joining me. Thank you guys for having me down today. I appreciate it. Um, a couple things in the uh, Maddie Rocks interviewing history here. Uh, Maddie Rocks, first interview in South Carolina. That's awesome. It's going to be a good one. I, I hope so. Yeah, I know it will be. And also, uh, Maddie Rocks has now partnered with Gander Mountain to do his first interview at a new location. Well, man, we got something in common. Uh, I've done a few things with Gander Mountain, but this is actually my first uh, on-the-scene grand opening. So uh, let's rock it out. Well, uh, thanks for uh, taking part in this little history with uh, my Maddie Rocks interview. Um, speaking of Gander Mountain, Daryl, when you hear the word Gander Mountain, you see it on a billboard, you're passing by, what comes to mind? Two things, man. I think immediately of the great outdoors, which is uh, outside of my family and, uh, you know, my faith. I think that's probably one of the biggest things in my life is just being able to spend time outside, you know, uh, and, and do my thing. And, uh, and it also, I always think of home because that's where I, I do most of my hunting and fishing and, uh, you know, whatever. Uh, so that's two good things that uh, Gander Mountain makes me think of. Right on. Uh, Daryl, we're only a few months into the uh, 2015 year, but what were some of the big highlights for you uh, in 2014 before we closed out the year? Uh, you know, we always, uh, we, we do a lot with the military. Uh, we always have. And uh, we had a couple of homecomings that, uh, that we were a part of, uh, you know, a lot of people think of our position right now that, that everything is shut down and, and that we're not involved, but we're still involved very much in Iraq, uh, ramping, actually ramping back up in some places, and and uh, we've never really slowed anything down all that much in Afghanistan. So uh, we've got guys constantly going out and coming back home, and, and so anytime we have an opportunity to do something like that, it, it's just awesome. And... Uh, I actually got to shut down a wee bit early this year, or this past year, and spend some quality time with my family during the holidays, and that was extra special. So it's not always the case. So. You got to fit that in. Love it, man. Daryl, if you would take Maddie Rock's listeners back to the early years of your life in Pyburn, Tennessee. And, <laughs> you said uh, that well. <laughs> <laughs> I do my research. I'm telling you, man. And uh, give us some insight to how music and uh, singing and uh, came into your life. Well, if you can imagine. Uh, where I'm from, uh, if you look at the states of Mississippi, Alabama, and Tennessee, and that place right there where they all three come together, we call it the Tri-States area, uh, there's a big lake there on the Tennessee River called Pickwick Lake, and that's where we grew up, right there, uh, about a mile from Pickwick Dam. And so, geographically, we're very challenged. Uh, you know, we're 70 miles from the nearest interstate, 70 miles from the nearest mall, so that makes it my favorite place in the world. Uh, and we didn't have a whole lot to do around there. I mean, it's not like we could load up and go to the theater. Uh, we didn't, we didn't have, we had an old one that was, you know, like condemned, but, uh, it just, it just made for, uh, the music on both sides of the family was kind of our entertainment. You know, when someone else might say, uh, let's go to, to town and do this or that, we'd say, let's, let's go to the back porch and pick a little after, you know, after we ate supper. Uh, so, as far as having musical influence and all that in my life, it was always there. I was just the only one out of all of the family members that ever, you know, thought about, I guess, taking it to a different level and using it to make a living and pay the bills. And, uh, I mean, it's been, been good to me, you know. I, I thank God for the gift, and, and uh, we just try to share the music that we make with folks. And uh, people, you know, fans are, are always uh, loyal, and, uh, you know, the rest is history. It's been a lot of fun. Right so on. that's how it, that's how it all came about. Who were some of the musical influences early on in your life who have helped shape and make you the great musician that you are today? Um, you know, I, I my brother, my older brother was into a lot of different kinds of music, and um, I always kind of migrated toward more of the country stuff. Uh, even early on, well, we all started out on the gospel stuff because my dad was a minister, and we didn't really have a choice. You know, he said, "This is what you got, you guys are going to play at least on Sunday and Wednesday," and uh, so there was that. And then I, I was really digging the bluegrass music early on, and when I discovered 
country music for me it was over i mean i i didn't care if i ever heard anything else uh i try to to introduce my little girl to lots of different kinds of music cuz i think it probably would have made me a little more well rounded but uh merle haggard uh, is probably at the top for me would i go back as far as like you know hank senior and jimmy rogers um vern gosden Will, Waylon and willie um Oh, uh, Gene Watson's one of my favorite country singers of all times. You know, you get on closer to the newer era, and it's, you know, George Strait and Alan Jackson, those guys. But anybody that has that more traditional sound, uh, not necessarily what you hear on today's mainstream country radio, because I'm, I'm not, uh, I, I'm just not a real big fan of some of that. It's gotten so far away from what we call country. But, hey, man, it, the, the business is still doing good, and those young men are are promoting our uh, our genre so i don't have anything negative to say about that either i just i just love the country stuff great influences you mentioned there um how instrumental was uh, your father uh in the decision making process for you to pursue music <laughs> my dad is one of those guys that uh it's all about hard work you know and uh and he he instilled an incredible work ethic in all of us boys uh but when it came down to the decision-making process of, of saying, hey, you know, I'm, I'm getting ready to try this, uh, I had worked my way into a small startup company, and uh, my background's in biology and chemistry. I'm kind of, a, uh, I guess, an anomaly in the country music business. I actually had a career before this career. But we did a lot of paper chemistry, and we, we catered to the paper mills all over the country, and my dad was in that business for a while. And, uh, you know, his whole thing was, I don't know, son, I don't know if you want to quit this. Uh, you got a, a good regular check coming in. And I was like, Dad, I'm, you know, I, I'm pretty sure I want to give this a try. So eventually I think he saw how uh, difficult I was struggling being torn between the two. And, and he came to me. He said, you're not getting any younger. You know, if you're going to do this, you need to go. So when, my mother always said you should go do whatever you want to do and try whatever you want to try because, you know, we live in America. You can do anything you want to do. But I think I was kind of waiting on my dad's blessing. And when he said, you know, go get him, I, I, I just turned it loose of everything. I walked into my partners and told them they could have my part of the company and I was going to give it a try. They all thought I was crazy, but, hey, it still pays the bills. So we must be doing something right. Absolutely. <laughs> Um, how did your early involvements uh, in the music writing process, working for the Fame Studios and EMI, and even uh, playing the honky tonk circuit, uh, prepare you for where you are today as a musician? Um, as far as you know, work, I, I did a lot of work, hard, difficult physical labor, getting through college and stuff like that. I was a commercial fish for a while and worked as a carpenter. But probably the most difficult times of my life, as far as just you know, being exhausted and working really hard was when I was playing four or five gigs a week, uh, writing songs for pennies. I, you know, my first, like, I guess you could say real paying gig as a songwriter was down there in Muscle Shoals with Rick Hall and all those guys. And uh, if, I'm, if I remember right, I think I made $150 a week. So if, it, if I hadn't had the gigs to supplement that, um, but I tell a lot of young people that aspire to, to do country music as a career that if I had not gone through that time where I was, a lot of the days the guys that were picking with me in the, in the band, they had regular jobs they had to hold down, so I'd have to move the whole PA by myself. I didn't even have a, when we first started, I didn't even have a hand truck. I, I was carrying those speakers and stuff in, you know, up on my shoulder, and, uh, a buddy of mine at, at a big old nightclub one night said, you know, uh, I got an old hand truck back here in the back that would help you a lot, and he just gave it to me. So it was tough, but I tell the young folks, you know, if you're not willing to work at this, it probably ain't going to happen because it's day and night for a lot of years until you finally lock down something. And uh, I, I eventually uh, got my start as an artist through my songwriting. And uh, that's a craft that you really have to work at. You know, a lot of people think if you can uh, make something rhyme that you can be a songwriter, but it's not as easy as it sounds. And, and uh, I think you sort of have to have a knack for getting inside of people's heads and inside their hearts to, to touch those things that we all relate to. And, uh, and uh, it's been a lot of fun, and I still learn a lot every day. So, Right on. Uh, you fast forward from that uh, to 1994 and your path to Nashville. Uh, where you want to become a, a successful country singer, how did you execute that plan? 
Um, as I said before, you know, um, the industry is a really weird animal. Um, I think one of the things that I had to do, I, I always wanted to stay close to home because of what I said earlier. That's, that's where I'm comfortable in the woods and, and on the lake and on the river. I mean, there's not a stump on Pickwick Lake that I don't know about because I've probably had a net hung on it one time or another. And I, it, I struggled with that. And they, even in my contracts at, at EMI, they said, uh, it specifically said you have to move to Nashville. So I finally made the move. And uh, I think I had kind of started to carve my niche a little bit as a songwriter. And I was, I was pushing uh, 32 or 3, maybe even 34 years old by this time. And I thought... They're not going to sign me as an artist, so I might as well really dig into this songwriting thing and get me a career started. And uh, so it was my songs and, and the style of writing, which I think, even to this day, I think about Merle and all that stuff that he did. And I think my writing was very much influenced by him, especially in the, the, the way that we write about things that we have lived. And so it was the songs and the songwriting that actually got me the record contract. They came out and saw me play a few times, and uh, James Stroud and those guys over at DreamWorks decided they wanted to sign. They asked my uh, publisher if they could just get the songs and, and record them on some young artist, and and they said, well, I, we would be okay with that, but I think Daryl's got a different thing in mind. And when they approached me, I said, you know what? If you want the songs, you got to take this old man with them. So <laughs> I signed my first record contract when I was 35 years old, and that just wasn't happening in Nashville at the time. But uh, I told, you know, my mom, I thank my mom and dad for giving me decent genetics. Uh, the only thing that was giving away my age at the time was uh, my hair color. And, you know, we got technology for that. So <laughs> I better take advantage of that. <laughs> um, you've done very well for yourself up to this point. Um, with that comes accolades. What to you has been the biggest accolade or award uh, that you have received to date as a musician? You know, uh, you, you actually, that's about the first question you've asked me that comes with most typical country music interviews. So what I'm saying to you, Matty, is that, that Matty rocks. You, dude, give it up for Matty, you guys. He's done a lot of work for this interview, a lot of research. It's really cool because I'm not having to interview myself. Um, you know, I've, I've always been the kind of person that um, I didn't – get into music for accolades right. uh if you have some success you're going to probably have a little bit of that and i'm thankful for every bit of it um but you know i was nominated for so many different awards uh acm all the cma awards uh you know artist of the year song of the year i, I can't album of the year i can't go back and remember all the nominations and what i do remember is that i never won a single one of them uh, and I never was the like the golden child of the CMA. They somehow they have a little bit of a political uh, angle on us country guys, and to me it's it's more like they should be thankful that we allow them to use our music, mm -hmm. and it, it's just weird. But uh, I said all that to say, you know, the person that I am. I grew up in a military family. And when we started having the, the, the blessed opportunity to go overseas and entertain our troops, man, those guys have honored me with some of the coolest things that anybody could ever uh, ask for, uh, just beautiful plaques and, and things that, uh, you know, I, 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 can't, I can't put it into words, but what I can tell you is what I tell everyone else, including the CMA. If I'd ever won anything like that, it would have had to have hung on my wall underneath those military accolades because, to me, there's no politics there. When, when these guys and gals go out there and put their lives on the line, and you don't know from one day to the next if you're going to make it home, mm -hmm. when, when those people are honoring you because you've gone, gone to the war zone, you know, uh, put your own self at risk, taking the time during the holidays or whatever to go and entertain – if I'm not mistaken, the last count, I think we've been to the war zone in Afghanistan 14 times, and we've been to the war zone in Iraq 14 times, and then we've been to Korea. I don't know how many times we've been to the islands of the South Philippines. Anywhere we've got troops, we'll go there and, and uh, try to lift their spirits or do whatever we can to, to help that morale. And uh, 
that's a real accolade. And this other stuff, you know, when you realize that when you win a CMA award, somebody was swapping and trading votes and this was changing hands and all that, so you, you start, you know, you sit back and you go, okay, I know who's going to win that. And I was, I was over at DreamWorks with Toby Keith. He just hit his big stride with How Do You Like Me Now? And I thought, man, he's going to get all the votes. And that's how it went down. So, but it's all good. I mean, I don't worry about stuff like that because I got some accolades that really mean something to me. Right on. Um, you've had the opportunity to play with many great artists and musicians along the way. Who to you has been the most influential artist that you've graced the stage with? <laughs> wow. Um, you know, it, it goes, you know, Alan Jackson was a great influence for me. Uh, going out and, and doing his tour and seeing how he put the whole thing together was uh, a lot of help to me. I, I realized that if you care enough about your people uh, and, and you do that right, that you'll actually wind up with the right people because like, like people kind of flock together. Um, as far as the music is concerned, I was very blessed as a songwriter. I, I wrote George Jones' last radio single. Uh, well, the one that, that really got any airplay. And uh, there's a bunch of cool stories around that song, but the coolest one was being able to go on stage with him at one point and, and sing that song with him. Um, he was one of my heroes, so, you know, that's a, that's a given. And um, George Strait, you know, we, and uh, there was, there's a few other guys, but I think what you have to do is you, you go out and you do your shows and, and then you watch these guys and you say, hey, I want, I want to incorporate that into what I do. And uh, eventually you find your own set and you just go out there and do what you do, so. But I love those guys, and, and they have paved the way for younger folks like us. And uh, I guess by now I'm sort of paving the way for some of those bro country guys. So Absolutely. Hang in there, country music fans. <laughs> We're going to bring some of that real stuff back before long. Thinking back to uh, a lot of the venues and stages that you've played on, some of them rich in history, I'm sure, which venue or stage to you, when you take it, takes your breath away there's only one real you know I, I still get a little uh, I don't I don't I wouldn't call it nervous but I might still feel a little butterfly or two sometimes before I walk out on the Opry stage and uh, you know I said this the other night we played the Opry during the uh, NRA weekend and I, I, I said I walked out there and the whole place was just packed with people and I said to them I sure hope every young artist that comes out here and, and starts talking on this microphone appreciates what this venue means and what it stands for as much as I do. Because every time, I mean, I'm still not an Opry member, haven't been asked, uh, but it doesn't matter to me because the fact that they call me a couple times a month and ask us to come out there and play is huge. I used to sit with my grandmother and watch it, or, you know, listen to it on the radio uh, when we couldn't even pick it up on television. And so... Um, but even though the Opry is awesome and powerful, I think the Ryman, for me, is the, the, the venue of all venues, and it's the mother church of country music. And uh, it's one of those rooms that whether you're, you're amplified or you're just unplugged, it, it just gives back to you. And you sort of feel the spirit of all those who have graced the stage when you're in there playing. It's just, it's, if you guys haven't been, you should try to make a show sometime because it's kind of a moving experience. I always think about they built that thing for sermons and for plays and, you know, before we had all this speakers and stuff, and um, they had those Civil War soldiers up in the balconies wounded, and they would be ministers on stage ministering to them, and I just I can't help but think about that stuff when we're out there playing. And it was the very first place that we ever uh, performed the song Have You Forgotten? on the, uh, on the uh, Ryman stage, so maybe that was part of the mojo that made it such a big hit. Very memorable. In two, in two stages, you mentioned that I hope to one day do a Matty Rocks interview in, so that would be great. Absolutely, man. Well, you should do that because uh, there's something about that room and that building that will, it'll take you on past anything you've done before. It, it, it calls on you in a special way. You'll enjoy it. Uh, Daryl, you're responsible for the release of seven great studio albums. 
uh, to date. Which one to you are you the most proud of and why? You know, it's hard to, uh, to, to look down the list of stuff we've done and really pick a favorite. But if I had to, I'd probably say it was my very first one. It was an album called The Hard Rain Don't Last. And um, it was several hit songs that came from that project. Um, I wrote most of the songs on there, and most of it was written from uh, my own life's experiences. I, <laughs> I at that by that point in my life, I'd spent about fifteen years with the same woman. We we were actually engaged about the last two or three weeks of that fifteen years, and then she decided not th- that we shouldn't get married, and uh, so it was, it was a tough time in my life, but. You know, I'd go back and listen to those Haggard songs or I'd go back and listen to, you know, some of my favorites. And I'd think, well, that's what, you know, these these hard times, that's what good country music's made out of. And so I just sat down and started writing about what I was feeling. And uh, lo and behold, you know, there's a world of people out there that all, we all experience the same emotions in life. And so I think that was the connection uh, for me with the audience. And uh, I certainly don't have any complaints. I wouldn't go back and change any of that. Although that same gal, she does get frustrated with me sometimes because she wanted royalties off that first album, and I wouldn't let her have them. <laughs> <laughs> where do the uh, where do the ideas and inspirations come from that create all your great music? Man, I I tend to believe that that's a spiritual thing. I, I mean, a lot of people uh, probably would think I'm crazy, but you know, musical talents and gifts are kind of an, an enigma you don't you know it's hard to put your finger on it i don't have i don't have a clue about uh music as far as reading you know, like a piece of sheet music and i know that sometimes real musicians think that we're crazy uh, i do know how to use the number system in nashville but that's for like you know people that don't know anything about music um i i never th- thought of it that way that there was really anything technical about it and i do believe that all the songs and the ideas, they all come from on high, you know, that I think we channel things like that. And just like Have You Forgotten or I Miss My Friend, I think that those songs were meant to help people. And uh, so, you know, if that's my way of reaching out to the masses and maybe someone hears that song and it helps them get through the day, then that's that's my uh, opportunity to give back what the good Lord's given to me. So Right on. Uh, the Daryl Worley, Worley Foundation and the uh, Tennessee River Run, still going strong. Um, give listeners and uh, the viewers here an insight to what that is all about. Well, we do. Uh, we started off. I just told uh, my management at the time. I said I want to do some sort of uh, charity events and and different things to raise money for, you know, my home and my local area because my mom and dad were the kind of people that always said, you know, the the most important thing that you can do in life is is to not forget where you come from and. Uh, so we started the Daryl Worley Foundation, and, uh, you know, in the early days, we didn't really know what we were doing, and it's like anything else in life that you do and, and, and that you have success with is, is a lot of trial and error. And So we started uh, working real hard uh, to do, like, the Tennessee River Run, which the first year, it was a public access television show that we shot with Pam Tillis and Gene Watson. And uh, we didn't really need a big audience, so we're going to try to keep the number of people down. But we needed a few people there so we could, you know, shoot shots in the bleachers and make it look like we had a crowd. (laughs) And no one was invited and 3,500 people showed up. So I said, my goodness, we could could do this and and have some sort of a benefit, you know, and raise money. So that started the uh, Tennessee River Run. And of course, now there's so many different events and and it, it actually takes up two uh, big weekends a year. Uh, we've raised millions of dollars. Uh, we built a Daryl Worley Cancer Treatment Center in my hometown, which I tried to get them to name that after someone else, but they said for, uh, you know, reasons uh, beyond what I might understand that they needed to use my celebrity status to raise money, so I, I backed off of it. I had, a, I had a good friend who had just passed away, and I, I said, with cancer, and I said, why, why don't we name it, you know, after him? But my little girl gets a kick out of that when we drive past it in my hometown. She goes, Daddy, you know, there's your name up on that building. And the letters are huge. They're as tall as a car. I mean, they're, they're, and I'm like, good night. But anyway, so we did that. And now we're uh, in the process of uh, 
acquiring some property, and we'll probably break ground this sometime this year on a wellness center that will be, uh, for the most part, directed at helping some of our youth get off of drugs and alcohol. Um, let's see. Uh, we add new events to the uh, River Run every year. Uh, we're doing a, a, a water boat poker run this year. We've always had the event, but we decided to turn it into one of our huge events, and uh, We've already landed a, a $50,000 sponsor for that, and we're going to try to find a, a, another $50,000 sponsorship to match that one, and, uh, and that'll take our whole cause to a, a different level. So, uh, man, we've got a ton of stuff going on. There's a good chance that we may be having Alabama there for the concert this year. They came to Savannah, Tennessee 31 years ago before anybody knew who they were. And I know they spent a lot of time playing here in the Myrtle Beach area. Uh, so if we get them back for this this year, it'll be huge for us. Well, it's quite the event in a packed schedule like you mentioned. Oh, yeah. Uh, part of Team Weatherby. Uh, what an honor to be part of that, uh, that uh, uh, group of firearms. How did it, that whole opportunity come to be for you? Man, I was talking to a buddy of mine who uh, has his own outdoor show. And, uh, and they have a, a nice little production company. They go out and, and document and film a lot of stuff for different folks. Um, but he told me he had this thing going with Weatherby where he was doing a lot of their shooting for Weatherby TV online and, and other things. And um, he said they had asked me about a, a country artist that might be interested in, in doing something with uh, with Weatherby and and. and and I'd always been a huge fan of Weatherby Firearms, uh, and just the fact that they're American-made is a, a, a big deal to me. I mean, they do have guns that are assembled overseas, and uh, shot, some of their shotguns are made in Turkey, but the guns that Weatherby puts out that I like are those really beautiful uh, walnut stocks and, you know, just a classic bolt-action rifle, uh, and that's all that stuff's made right here in America. So that meant a lot to me. And they're a small group. They're not a huge... Uh, you know, pouring the money out on your company. It's not about that. They pay us mostly with product. So now I've <laughs> I got a Weatherby rifle in just about every caliber with uh, several different versions of them. Um, and I try to, you know, get some of those rifles for my family members and dear friends because uh, they're just, it's just a special thing to own one. Um, they do a lot of different events and so they fly us all over the country. But the team members are uh, amazing people. I mean, I, they, they, I, I think they really spend a lot of time picking the guys and, and gals because they want down-home people that care about, you know, the same kind of things that I care about, home and family and God and country. And uh, So we got, you know, Chad Mendez from the UFC. He's just a great kid. Uh, Brendan Clark from, from uh, the PBR. Uh, he's retired now, but he was still riding bulls when I got to know him. Uh, Bear Pasco, who was a Super Bowl champion, tied in, played for the Giants, and now he's playing for uh, – well, actually, he left Atlanta this year and may be working on a deal with uh, the Cowboys. Uh, Willie Bloomquist, the professional baseball player. Uh, Jesse Duff, she's like the five- or six-time national champion pistol shooter. Uh, and let's see, there's a there's actually a few more, but I guess what they did was they picked someone from all different professions and all different genres to uh, be a part of the team. And it's strictly a kind of a promotional thing. And so I know a lot of people approach them now and say, you know, what what was your motivation to put this together? And they said, we just wanted to be noticed. And I think they've they've done a real good job with that. And they've uh, It's definitely affected their sales and numbers, but Weatherby is one of those companies that don't really care so much about uh, growing into something bigger than they could handle right there in their little shop in you know Paso Robles, California. They're just more about keeping the quality where it is and and making the rifles that shoot the hardest and uh, and, and the most accurate. So it's good to be a part of that team. Um, I had one of my favorite guns out in Colorado this year, and we were shooting a forty-inch metal plate at a thousand yards and i thought man i i never dreamed that i'd be able to do this with a rifle so I, I killed my first deer i had quit hunting with a rifle until this weatherby thing came along and i was just really getting into bow hunting more and uh i killed my first deer last year at over 500 yards so that's a whole different challenge it's a lot of fun so it's cool you're a husband and a father 
how do you balance the personal life and the music life to make it all work? Well, my, you said I'm a husband and a father. I'm, there's, I'm sorry. There, no, there's days my wife would debate <laughs> that with you, but, uh, um, you know, at the end of the day, that's that's the part of of my life that I enjoy the most, uh, and I and I haven't always been that way. I'm gonna tell you, our baby came along as a surprise because my wife wasn't supposed to be able to have children. So you know, it's another way that the good Lord uh, brings things into your life that you're not expecting that change you and and kind of it gives him a little leverage where he can bend you in places that you haven't been bending and he can form you into what he wants you to be so that was uh that's how she's affected me and uh but it's tough it's really a difficult thing to juggle um i don't at this point in my career i could sort of there's a couple different directions i could go and I think I could uh, transition into the songwriting thing, which is actually what I went to Nashville to do. And and I think I, we would be just fine. But I have a hard time passing up some of the gigs because I still got the bug and I want to go out and play live. Uh, but also, when you look at the money sometimes and you go, that's a pretty lucrative opportunity. It's hard to say no because, you know, you want to be able to give your child the best at, at whatever uh, she's uh, involved in. And so... Um, I'm really juggling that a lot right now, and I'm trying to get to a point where uh, I, I let more of those jobs pass and, and, you know, just stay at home as much as, as possible. But if you're going to be a country singer and you're going to be on the road, you're going to be gone a lot. I don't care how you turn it. And so it's just one of those sacrifice things. But, you know, I think back about my childhood, and my dad was a minister, but he also worked full time at a paper mill. And anybody that's ever been around the paper industry knows that's that's two full-time jobs, especially if you're in management. And so when he wasn't working, he was out visiting with his congregation, and my mom was like, you know, we were all, it was almost like a single parent. And so I, I think what it boils down to is, is if you make that time when you're at home really count, and it's quality time, and and they know that you love them and that you're doing a whole lot of what you're doing because you want to bring home the bacon, I think in the end, it'll all come out all right. Right on. Uh, Daryl, what would you say is your biggest accomplishment as a musician to date? Wow. No no one has made me think this much about my career in a long time. Um, That's the Matty Rocks experience. You know, it's probably what I, I uh, alluded to before. Um, I think the fact that you know, growing up in a military family, I I didn't have to really give it any thought when they approached me about going overseas uh, into the war zone to uh, visit and entertain our troops. Um, and I didn't, you know, you hear all these uh, stories from the warriors in your family, and you think because you've heard all this stuff firsthand that you know you're going to know exactly what's going on over there in the war zone, <laughs> but. Uh, as soon as I hit the ground in Afghanistan the first time, I, I thought to myself, you don't know until you go. And so if you're out there today and, and listening to us and you've served uh, in the military uh, or if you've ever been deployed, hats off to you because uh, it's not an easy gig. And, and it'll inspire you to no end to see what these people do on a daily basis. Um uh, you know, it's not a gig for everybody because everybody cannot uh, wrap their head around uh, going out on the job every day and taking a chance on getting killed or not coming home to your family. And, and at the same time, they couldn't possibly wrap their head around taking someone else's life, which is exactly what has to happen in some situations. So that's the, that's the real side of war that we don't ever talk about. And when it got to a point... Uh, where, you know, the the higher ups in the military were inviting me to come to uh, events and do a couple songs, and I realized it wasn't really about the music. They were getting me there so they could honor me somehow. To me, that that, I mean, it meant it meant more to me than any music award could ever mean, and I think that that's probably my biggest accomplishment outside of the songs that I've written. And had recorded by some of my heroes, you know, um, George Jones, Charlie Pride, people like that. 
you know, and I, I, I'd still love to get a Georgia Strait cut. I had a song on my first album called Too Many Pockets. It was a little swing tune. <laughs> These are the kind of mistakes you make when you're young and stupid. Well, not so young, but anyway, we talked about that. Um, George wanted to record this song, and uh, I told Frank, my producer, I said, I, you know, we've already got the vocal on, and it sounds great. I think I'm going to hang on to that and put it on my album. And uh, that was a mistake. So anyway, we know that now. What will be the key ingredient that uh, keeps you making great country music for many more years to come? Well, I mean, I think it's really goes back to the uh, paying the bills, and the, the key ingredient ingredient in any type of music is those people you see standing right out there. And, uh, you know, God willing, the folks that know what I'm about and the folks that love country music are not going to go away um, I do believe that as a whole, the industry has kind of alienated a lot of people from our genre of music because they've allowed it to turn into something that only the really, really young people are jumping up and down about. And I think, you know, I look out at this audience and I think these these are the guys that love the same kind of music that I love uh, and I miss it. And, and it'll be back. It's uh, something that good doesn't just go away and never come back. Uh, but I think that we have to pay attention to, if you go back and look at, at the numbers, you know, the late 80s and early 90s, country music was selling more records than it's ever sold in the history. And if you if you think about the music was out then, you know, you got people like uh, Randy Travis coming onto the scene and he revived that traditional sound. And I mean, I just, tr I'd miss it. Uh, I can't tell you how much I miss it, but uh, I believe that, the audience is the key ingredient. And then if the good Lord sees fit to keep channeling those songs down, I'm just going to keep on doing what I do. I hope to wind up out on my farm in West Tennessee and sit on the deck and feed the deer and the turkey and just sit there with my guitar and turn out those country songs until they uh, take me over to the graveyard. What does the future hold for Daryl Worley? Lord only knows. Um, hopefully I'll collect a few more Weatherby rifles. I I love to shoot stuff. I got a new song. I might even play it. It's so new, I'll probably forget the words, but one of the lines uh, says, I love, I love killing what I eat, and the fishing's pretty good most days. So a whole lot of that, I hope. Um, and, and, you know, just um, the opportunity to get out and do things with people that you really like, uh, just like hanging out with you guys here today. Uh, Gander Mountain might be part of my new game plan. We'll just see how that works out. Uh, where can fans keep up with everything going on with you and including all the great music you're putting out? We're getting ready to totally revamp our website. And uh, it's good now, but it's going to be like supercharged here in about two more months. And uh, we've got five different projects going right now, one of which I hope will wind up in Gander Mountain Stores. Uh, it's called Music and Memories, and it chronicles. It's music and uh, DVD documentary of my journeys to the war zone and i think people would uh if i can watch it other people will love it and uh honestly my wife and i watched the rough cut of the, the documentary and it was compelling to say the least uh, and it's all about shining a positive light on what our military does you know so many things concentrate on the negative side of of, of whatever they're doing and this is all uplifting for our troops and they need that so uh I'm proud of that. We got a greatest hits coming this year. Uh, I'm going to be finishing up my first gospel project this year. So all that stuff will be uh, available online, and you'll be able to get the information right there at DarylWorley.com. Right on. Daryl, I'm going to give you the opportunity to send a message to Maddie Rock's listeners all around the United States and around the world who are going to hear this interview. What would you like to say to them? Well, uh, keep it country, folks. And when I say that, I mean your music and uh, and don't forget we're American and that's a that's a huge responsibility these days, especially these days. And uh, also uh, support to my man Maddie because this is without a doubt in probably twelve or fifteen years of doing interviews the the most uh, in depth and the most prepared of anybody that that has that I've interviewed with. And he's actually made me really uh, dig deep back into my bag of tricks and think of things that I haven't thought of in years and years and years. So hats off to you, brother. Thank you. And uh, 
it's just good to be in South Carolina, man. You guys rock down here. I wrote some of my early hits right over here in Garden City, so thank you all for the inspiration. Daryl, thank you very much for taking the time out of uh, this great event to sit with me. This was truly an honor. Continued success to you and everything you have going on in your musical arena. You've heard it here, Matty Rocks listeners. On the road with Matty Rocks, Daryl Worley. Matty Rocks, out. Thanks, brother. Thank you. Hey, guys, this is Daryl Worley, and I officially had the Matty Rocks experience. Believe me, I did it.